a friend whispered in my ear. She said, hey, I have a friend who needs to do the Warlock Mount quest, and nobody in our guild will do it. Do you think you guys could hook him up? Ten minutes later, we were all standing in front of Dire Maul, and that's how I met Pyridan. As we lay each of our friends' tunes to rest, you'll hear a lot of game-oriented stories. But the first place I started wasn't there. It was with the person. The best memories aren't out killing pixels. They're the times we sat down and were just people together. We like to sit down and talk, and we always tried to find a good place to do it. Towns were full of people going back and forth. It could be very distracting. A lot of them wanted to talk to you. But if you went out of town, there could be a lot of monsters going back and forth, and that could be distracting as they all wanted to kill you. So we made a habit of finding out of the way places high up above the action where nothing was going on. There are a lot of really fascinating places in well. But we both agreed that Nagrand was one of the most beautiful. And we both loved these magical islands with their waterfalls falling from the sky. I don't care if it's geologically impossible. It was pretty. On the border between the Searing Gorge and the Burning Steps stands a massive mountain. Black Rock Mountain is the home to several instances, several raids. There are worlds within worlds in this mountain. And we've explored every one of them together. The very first part of this mountain we explored was a dungeon called Black Rock Depths. Black Rock Depths is almost the anti-iron forge. Here the dark iron dwarves make their home in its pools of lava. Conquering this dungeon is a ton of work. It's huge and it's hostile. As you fight your way through this dungeon, you're almost surprised to come around a corner and across the bridge and find yourself in a bar. It is a dwarven city after all. There's got to be a place for beer. In Black Rock Depths, that place is the Grim Guzzler. Everybody has a story of the Grim Guzzler. We've all run errands for Mistress Nagmara to get her to open the back door for us. We've leaped through lava and hopped across tiny islands and fought fire elementals in the midst of a fiery lake to get to a special forge. We've mined dark iron. We've all heard the story of the day that Uncle Hecti agged the entire bar and got the whole party killed. Okay, that one was hilarious. I still stop and laugh every time I pass the spot where I died. It seemed like a really reasonable place to leave a tune named Brudison. So Brew and I took the walk through Black Rock Depths, sat down at the table right next to Private Rock Knot, had a drink, and said goodbye for the last time. We tried for months to beat Encourage, or rather, to beat the twins. There is a boss in that raid that's actually two bosses. One of them can only be harmed by physical damage. The other one can only be harmed by magic. Now, that's pretty straight up. You keep them separated, and you put all the physical damage people in one place and all the magic damage people in another, right? But Blizzard knows that would be way too easy. They wouldn't do that to us. No, these two teleport swap places every 30 seconds. It takes a little bit of coordination, and we kept dying over and over. And finally, I decided I wasn't going to fight. I was just going to watch and see what was happening. And when I did, I realized that one of our party members was casting dots, damage over time. Well, every time those two bosses would swap places, they would ag, they would turn their attention to the first thing that damaged them. And that dot meant that the boss who had just teleported away would turn right back around to the other group. Well, the problem with that is that when those two get close together, they heal each other, and it's impossible for us to damage them fast enough to kill them. And before we started our final attempt for the night, I whispered to Chuck, take all the dots off your toolbars. He had been very conscientious, 
but hadn't realized he was hitting some keys by habit. Chuck took the dots off his toolbars, and we downed those bosses on the very next try. The Guildmaster has seen each of Chuck's tombs home, but Slowpoke was a slightly different story. I could say, as a bank alt, he wasn't really a member of our guild, but we know that's not true. He was Chuck, and Chuck was family. But Slowpoke was one fine-dressed bank alt. I always found that pretty original. Apparently, it wasn't as original as I thought. I will say I did make one change to Slowpoke before I logged him out for the last time, because Do you think he was wearing brown shoes that? with his tuxedo, and I just couldn't leave it at that. I bought him a pair of black shoes. And instead of bringing out the Guildmaster, I brought out my best dress tune to come and see Slowpoke off on his journey. The first time you go someplace in Azeroth, you have to walk. But once you've reached that place, you can talk to a flight master and you can fly there from any place that's connected from then onward. There is a lot of slogging around when you are low level and well. When one of us created a new character, we'd always get together and the other one would bring their high level character with a flying mount that could carry a passenger. And we would fly across the continent, letting the other person pick up all the flight paths. Now, one of the challenges of this is if you're the one flying, you can't actually tell when the other person has successfully got that added to their map. So to make it easier, Chuck added a macro Every time he would click the flight master and once he had the map, he would click the button on his toolbar and his character would say, got it, thanks, Mama Cow. Mama Cow, because my Torrin was the guild master. After we met, the next time he saw me in game, he said, I just can't call a lady a cow. I had to almost cry on him to get him to go back to calling me Mama Cow. I earned that loving nickname as we flew walkie across the continent that he hadn't been on before. I couldn't resist stopping at one last flight master. Heroes of the Horde questing in Frostfire Ridge have the opportunity to build a garrison, a home all their own, decorated based on their achievements, buildings chosen according to their plan for their small town. The garrison is instance. When you walk into your garrison, you're literally the only player in town but you can invite other players to join you. Most of Chuck's low-level characters were bank alts or one-time tunes that he created to play with his daughter. But Walkie was a real character. Or maybe I just like to think so because he's a little chamois and I didn't have the heart to delete a little baby sham. So instead, I took him home with me. Walk will live in my garrison, safe and sound, protected by my followers, surrounded by the things that I've gathered up in my Warcraft home. Our Horde Guild plays on a server or realm called Nordrasil, named for the great world tree of Azeroth. Grown from an acorn on a sacred mountain, bathed in the waters of the Well of Eternity and blessed by the dragon flights, Nordrasil brought immortality and immunity to disease to the night elves who lived within its shade. When the original Nordrasil was destroyed, a new world tree was grown, and that tree is guarded by Malfurion Stormrage, Cenarius, and the Druids of Azeroth. It was to Nordrasil that we brought Pyridan's Druid, so that he can spend his eternity with the Druids of Azeroth, guarding the life of the world tree. Throughout the worlds of Warcraft, there are different groups of people called factions that you can get to know, and if you do enough work for them, they come to like you and sometimes offer you special opportunities that you wouldn't get otherwise. One such faction is the Oracles, and the Oracles have a vendor that sells a little unobtrusive egg, and that egg hatches into, well, most of the time, nothing, sometimes into a cute pet, and occasionally, into a pretty impressive looking dragon that you can ride like a horse. When I got to that level, 
I faithfully went out every three days, bought a new egg, incubated it, took care of it until it hatched over and over again, trying to get that dragon. Chuck didn't know what might be in that egg, but he figured if I was going out there every three days, it must be something pretty cool. So of course, having no idea why he was doing it, he went out, he bought the egg, and guess who got the dragon? He knew immediately what I was doing out there and was incredibly pleased with himself. The next time he met up with me, he made sure to be riding it. And in fact, he rode that green dragon almost every time he was with me from that day forward. When it came time to find a home for Chuck's thief or rogue, I knew exactly where I thought he'd be comfortable. I left him in a warm spot in the woods right next to the Oracle vendor. Every now and again, our guild would have a guild meeting. We'd try to find out of the way places that wouldn't be uh, too crowded and would let us talk uninterrupted. One of our first was at a place called Lake Jeroon, high in the skies above Tarakar Forest. In later years, this would be one of the places that Chuck and I would meet up when we wanted to just sit and talk for a while. When the Wrath of the Lich King expansion released, several features of original Azeroth magically moved to the new continent. This included the once abandoned city of Dalaran, now lively and full of mages, and the original game raid called Naxxramas, full of undead. With the rise of the power of the Lich King, this became a major point in the game again. Another element of the lore with Lich King was the introduction of the class called the Death Knight. It seemed natural to take Chuck's Death Knight to Naxxramas. The names of the ranks in our guild are based on Western lore around angels. Angel, Archangel, Seraph, Cherub. And every year on its birthday, we would note the passing of another angelversary. On our third angelversary, we gathered up the guild, went to play in a disused little area of a zone called Ashara, just outside of the Great Horde capital of Orgrimmar. It's a resort up in the mountains that you can't get to on foot. You have to be able to fly or have a guildmate who's willing to carry you up there. Long after most of our guildies had returned to their questing, and gone out to save Azeroth, Chuck and I sat around in the pool at Gallywix's Pleasure Palace, talking, hanging out, and just enjoying being friends. It seemed natural to bring his little goblin mage to this spot. With Burning Crusade, the first expansion to WoW, one of the great additions was that characters got flying horses. You could now move a lot faster through the worlds. But probably the most impressive flying mountain all of WoW in those days was the Netherwing Drake. This was not an easy thing to get. It took weeks of hard work. There's a wonderful storyline behind it in which you're saving the entire race of Netherwing from horrible enslavers. And at the end of it, one of them offers to be your friend and fly with you, not as a servant and not as a piece of property, but as a friend and true companion. Now, any quest line where you're saving an entire species of creatures has to have a pretty dramatic ending. And at the ending of that storyline, you narrowly escape death by having a dragon whisk you away to safety and fly you from Netherwing Ledge to the capital city of Shatrap, where you meet all of your new friends and choose one to be your companion. Our guild always made a big deal of this. When we knew somebody was getting close to that point, we would gather up on Netherwing Ledge. Anyone who had another drake would be there on their dragon to follow you along on your rescue ride which has to be the slowest flight in all of Azeroth. That dragon crawls, but somehow it doesn't seem so slow when you're surrounded by guildies. We'd all hover there in the air, the angelic dragon flight, waiting for our guildie to find their new friend 
and to cheer them on as they both took to the skies for the first time together. I took Icar back out to the ledge where he could sit on the top of the hill and watch the dragon races go by. There used to be a quest in a WoW, legendary for its vague instructions. WoW Classic brought that quest back into the game. We left Classic Peer with Mancrick and Classic Ike standing over Mancrick's wife. During the fall festival, there's a quest available that you can't get any other time of year. It's called Honoring a Hero. Each faction, Alliance and Horde, has a hero. And it's always fascinated me that the hero of one side is the villain of the other. Uther, the paladin of the Silver Hand, who refused to commit genocide, refused to kill a whole city full of people just in case they got the scourge. He's a hero to the Alliance for standing up and doing the right thing. The Scourge, however, turned a whole bunch of people into undead, and the undead faction on the Horde think Uther is a coward who couldn't do what was necessary to keep them all from being cursed. Grom Hellscream, hero of the Horde, saved them all from servitude to the demon Manoroth. He's a liberator, and the Horde rever him. To the Alliance, he's the one who brought that fight to their town and endangered them all. Every time I switch between my Alliance and Horde tunes, I'm reminded that whether they're the hero or the villain, it's just a matter of where you're standing. The quest to honor the heroes takes you to their monuments, but for a low-level tune, those monuments are hard to get to without dying a lot. So the very first year we did them, we gathered up our guildies, surrounded all the low levels, and brought them safely so they could honor our heroes, then saw them safely home again. It became a tradition. As everyone got big enough to do it on their own and didn't need protection anymore, fewer and fewer people turned up. But every year, Chuck and I went together. There might be 30 people around us, and there might be just the two of us. But we always went, and we always went together. Kinoga was the second character that Chuck ever made, and he transferred Kini to Paranoid so that he could join our Alliance Guild. The first time Kini and I made this pilgrimage together, we had one of those perfect moments. Everything just aligned, and we got what is still my favorite screenshot of all my time in WoW, and it was Chuck's too. There was no question of where Kini and I would spend our last moments together. And so we reached the end, the name that so many of us knew so well, Pyridan the Warlock. I used to tease him and call him Demon Lover, and my good Christian friend would laugh about the fact that he was playing with imaginary demons, or he'd quote them up at Treasure Island. He's got demons? Cool. I told you that how we met was the quest for his warlock to summon his fiery demon steed from, from the nether realms. And so, my friend, in the end, we come back to the beginning. We left Pyridan in the first place that we ever brought him to, to the depths of Dire Maul. The world of Azeroth is smaller without my demon-loving friend. Sometimes I think I'll never do the honoring a hero quest again. And other times I know, I know I'll do it every year. <laughs>